Welcome, everyone. I, we really appreciate everyone. Uh, this is an exciting Frank Church Symposium, the 45th year. My name is Heidi Jarvis Grimes. I am the Director for Strategic University Initiatives and College Advancement for the College of Arts and Letters. So welcome. Um, I wanted to thank you again. Um, this is uh, entitled the Richard Foster Lecture. It's a named lecture. And today we are honored, and it's my pleasure, to introduce a dear friend, <laughs> Dr. Rafi Ahmed, Director of the Vaccine Center and Georgia Research Alliance Professor of Microbiology and Immunology at the is, is prestigious Emory University School of Medicine. Dr. Ahmed is a world-renowned immunologist. Dr. Rafi Ahmed, also a member of the National Academy of Science, and I think we all know that that is an incredible honor to be bestowed on anyone. And uh, as far as we have researched, Dr. Ahmed is the only Academy member in the state of Idaho. That is very special. Um, I would like to discuss a little bit about his work. Dr. Candy Turley Ames and I had an opportunity, and I, I cherish this. And Rafi, you need to know that this has stuck with us, and we've told everyone in the community and beyond. Uh, we had the opportunity to visit um, Rafi at his lab, and I, a lab doesn't do it justice. I want to say a wing named after him and his wonderful students and, and so forth and the research he's doing at Emory University that impacts us when we think about the theme of the Frank Church Symposium. It impacts globally. And so it was very special for us, Rafi, and a real honor when you took us around the your, the entire system, as well as the campus, we really got a sense of the work that you're doing and the importance and all the lives that you touch and will continue to touch in a very important way. So having said that, his work during the past decade has been highly influential in shaping our current understanding, as you can see, of memory T cell differentiation and antiviral T and B cell immunity. The long-term goal of Dr. Ahmed's research is to understand the mechanisms of the B and T cell memory and to use this information to develop new important vaccines for the prevention and treatment of disease. We all know this is an important topic. I mean, we see this on the news every day. We're looking at different viruses, different resistance to viruses and diseases, uh, the most current being the Zika conversation. <laughs> um, and we hear all kinds of different information about that. And that is why we have the expertise of Dr. Ahmed to bring some clarification um, to some of these areas that we're hearing about that are affecting us globally. One of the quotes I have from uh, Dr. Ahmed's work is, and if I, I'm honored to read this, the mechanism of viral persistence viral persistence remains a major unresolved problem, and the goal of our lab is to understand how viruses evade or suppress the immune res response and remain persistent. And so I think that this is one of the incredible opportunities that we have here, and a real honor to have Dr. Ahmed. And I also need to say that he is a Bengal. And if you go, I also ask you to go on the Emory site and look at his bio. It is a beautiful bio. In fact, I think it's one of the best ones I've ever seen. It is professional, personable, and it mentions a few special people in our community here. And I really think it brings Pocatello to the rest of our nation and beyond. So without further ado, Dr. my friend, Dr. Rafi Ahmed, thank you. extremely kind of you. Uh, coming to Pocatello actually is like coming home to me. Uh, I came to Pocatello in 1970, uh, and people always ask me, how did you, and I grew up, I was born in the city of Hyderabad, a great city, um, and, uh, and from Hyderabad I came straight to Pocatello, and <laughs> on, on a direct flight. <laughs> so people have asked me, how, how did you end up in how did you go? To, why did you go to Idaho State, and why did you go to Pocatello? And it, it also remains a mystery to me, you know, how that happened. <laughs> but I think it was one of the best things that happened to me. Uh, those really were my formative years, and uh, I really 
uh, I think I fell in love with this country almost immediately after coming here. And I think it was because of the people I met here. And I want to acknowledge uh, the Bo family, um, uh, Roger Bo, uh, Donna Bo, and Karen, who's here also, uh, their son, Carl Bo. Uh, and they were my host family, and we have remained friends for the, uh, for the past 46 years. And I think it was the hospitality of people like the Bo family, and just the, how I was welcomed, and how I was welcomed by this wonderful and hospitable community. I also want to acknowledge uh, my professors, <laughs> uh, Ron McCune and June McCune, who, who are here. Um, uh, Ron was actually the chair of uh, the department at that time and taught a wonderful course in biochemistry that I still remember. And Joan McCune actually was my thesis advisor. Uh, and it's wonderful that they're here. Um, so what I want to, sh uh, and so this is an unusual talk in this wonderful symposium that's dealing with very, very important social and political issues that we face. So this is a bit of a digression or a diversion to a little bit of science. Uh, so what I'm going to do today in my, I have about 16 slides, so it'll be, and the slides are simple. There might be some slides which look like data, but please ignore it. Don't worry. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, even though those slides look very un strange to you, I'll just give you the bottom line from those slides. Okay? So what I'll do in this, um, my prepared talk actually is not that long, um, maybe 25 or 30 minutes at most. Uh, uh, but when we have the question period, feel free to ask any questions about what I present or any other questions uh, that come to, come to you in terms of uh, the area of vaccination or infections and so on. Okay. So um, let me start by, why, what does this title mean? So why did I come up with the title, um, Immune Memory to Immune Therapy? And our, the historical interest of our lab, I set up my own lab in 1984 at UCLA, which is where I started as a faculty member. And I was fascinated, uh, even though I didn't really train as an immunologist, I, my PhD actually is in virology and molecular genetics, it's not in immunology. But I got fascinated by the question of immunological memory. So what is immunological memory? Immunological memory is when you first encounter a pathogen uh, and you recover from that infection. You're then left with a memory of that infection. Your immune system is left with that memory. Uh, and sometimes this recognition of the pathogen you encountered as a child is there for the rest of your life. And that's why very often you don't get infections twice. So I was fascinated by the mechanism of how our immune system remembers our pathogen for years and years. And this has been a major topic of our investigation in the lab for the last 35 years or so. So I'll just share with you a couple of highlights of, of that, of what we have done there, uh, without going into without going to any detail, I should say, just highlight a few things. And then why the immune therapy part? The immune therapy part uh, came from really, again, the, the basic or the fundamental question we were addressing on immunological memory. Uh, provided a clue to what happens if there is a chronic infection uh, to your immune system and that immune system gets turned off instead of being active. And that resulted in some observations about uh, some molecules that keep the system down, keep the immune system down. They act like a break on the immune system. And, and that break that we were not the only ones who worked on that break and identified it. But that break uh, has resulted in some uh, therapy that's now being used to treat cancer. Okay. So that's why I have the title as Immune Memory, which is where we started, which is where our heart still belongs. Uh, but it has, from that has come some observations which have helped and are helping now in the treatment of cancer. I do not claim any credit for the treatment of cancer. These are the wonderful cancer scientists have done it, but there was one important discovery that we made that clearly helped uh, this path towards immune therapy. So that's going to be the sum of my talk, and I'll walk you through a few slides. So the first few slides I want to show you is not an experiment that was done by me or done by any other scientist. It 
was an experiment of nature. And I'll describe to you this great experiment of nature, which told us a lot about immunological memory. And this experiment of nature took place almost 200 years ago. And it took place in on the Faroe Islands. How many of you know or have heard of the Faroe Islands? Good, good. I see a few hands raising up. Uh, so the Faroe Islands So the Faroe Islands, a small group of islands below Iceland and the mainland on the main coast of Europe. So you can see they're fairly isolated. And this experiment starts in the experiment starts in 1781. So in 1781, there was a measles epidemic on the Faroe Islands. Everyone knows what measles is. It can be a terrible disease. It can ki kills a lot of people. It kills children. We have a wonderful vaccine against measles now, but still, a lot of people in uh, underdeveloped countries still die of measles. So there was an epidemic of measles in 1781. And then the Faroe Islands at that time were under the Danish government. And for political reasons that I'm not aware of, uh, the Danish government had imposed some restrictions on travel from the European mainland to the Faroe Islands. So the Faroe Islands for the next 65 years, from 1782 to 1845, remained very, very isolated because there was no one going from the main European uh, land into the Faroe Islands. So what this meant was that measles at that time was very prevalent in, in Europe, a lot of people getting measles, but there was no one going there and exposing people to, to measles. So this, these islands, basically, there were no reported cases from 1782 to 1845, almost 65 years or so. Then the Danish government, uh, ease the restrictions of travel from Europe to Faroe Islands. And that happened in, in 1846. In 1846, suddenly there was trade between the Europe mainland and Faroe Islands. A lot of people started going back and forth. And then there was this massive outbreak of uh, uh, epidemic of measles that occurred on the Faroe Islands. And almost 75 to 95 percent of the population got measles. And when this happened, the Danish government sent this man, Ludwig Paynham, Peter Ludwig Paynham. Uh, this is a photograph of him when he's older, but actually he was sent to the Faroe Islands in 1846 to investigate the measles epidemic. He was an epidemiologist, and at that time, actually, he was just 26 years old, and he was a medical student. And so the report he did on the Faroe Islands actually was his thesis work for his medical degree. And this still remains, and I'll, the next slide I'll read to you, uh, and, uh, a, a couple of uh, conclusions that he made. And it was a remarkable epidemiological study that was done by Paynham. And that's on the next slide. So this is Paynham from his uh, thesis. So he, the first point he found was that, and this is his writing, and this actually was published, this paper was published in 1847. 47, this paper was published in Virtue's archive. And then if any of you are interested in reading this or looking at it, it was then republished or reprinted in Medical Classics in 1959. So this is, uh, this is the words of, uh, in that thing. So what he says is, of the many aged people still living on the pharaohs who had had measles in 1781, not one was attacked the second time. So these were old people. They were in their 70s. Okay. They were in their 70s and maybe even older. So they remembered that when that epidemic happened 65 years ago there, they had gotten measles. None of these people, none of these individuals got measles when 95% of the population was exposed to measles. And then he had a wonderful control group. It's like doing an experiment. <laughs> where you have mice that you vaccinate and don't vaccinate, you had a wonderful control group. Because not everyone, not every child had gotten measles in that epidemic 65 years ago. So there were a 
lot of old people still living there who had not gone through measles in earlier life and all of them were attacked the second time. So, so why is this? So basically what it meant, meant was that protective immunity for 65 years was there in the absence of re-exposure. So the fact that if somebody got an infection, they did not get it again, was known from the time of the Greek. It was, there's a famous quote there saying that people who got the plague once did not get the plague again. But of course, at that time, no one even knew what the plague was. No, we knew nothing about the immune system. We also knew nothing about microbes at that time. It was not even known what caused the disease. The disease could have come from the gods, could have come from the air, could have come from anywhere. Pathogens were not described, microbes were not described. And even at this time, it was really not known what caused measles. So this kind of predates everything. But what did this, and so even those observations were there that if you got an acute infection once and recovered, you didn't get it. Uh, there was really no connection between why that happened or, or what the reason for that was. But this was important. Uh, not only at that time, but also in retrospect to the immunologists and scientists much later, because this showed that you could have protective immunity in the absence of re-exposure. I again stress, absence of re-exposure. That's very important, because if you're living in a, now we come back, we, we fast forward 200 years, we know about the immune system, we know about T and B cells, uh, we know about pathogens, we know which viruses cause which disease. Okay? And the prevailing notion still was, until many, many years ago, that the reason you have protected is because you get subclinical infections, and that keeps raising your immunity. And part of that is true. If you go to endemic areas, uh, let's say endemic area for malaria, there's more protection in the population there than in a population that's not. So this re-exposure does help. Okay? But this experiment said that actually it's something intrinsic. It's something inside the body. You don't need to get re-exposure to maintain immunity. There's something in your body that is going to protect you. So this was an intrinsic mechanism that was protecting for many, many years. So now, what, how do we typically protect ourselves from reinfection? This is probably the simplest slide you'll ever see about protective immunity. <laughs> Because of course it's a highly complex, uh, 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 it's, it's highly complex. People, immunologists and scientists, we argue about it and uh, shout at each other because we don't agree with each other. And this is what keeps us uh, entertained uh, while we do our science. Okay? But I think that most would agree with this uh, very simple, oversimplified uh, mechanisms of protective immunity. So the, our first line of defense against protective immunity is having antibodies having preformed antibody against that pathogen. Does everyone know what antibody is? Is there anyone who doesn't know what an antibody is? It's highly, highly educated, highly informed group. <laughs> so antibodies are, are molecules which are circulating in our blood and can also be at our mucosal sites. And these, and we have antibodies that can be specific for different pathogens. Uh, so if you have preformed antibody that can neutralize measles virus, that is your first line of defense. Measles virus usually enters through the respiratory tract and then spreads systemically and goes all over the body and that can then gets to the skin and you have the rash and cause terrible disease and, and as I said, is, is a killer of children. Okay. Um, so if there's pre-existing antibody, then that is the first line of defense because when the virus enters, it, the virus, the antibody binds to the virus and will prevent it from infecting the cell. So it neutralizes. The term that we use is it neutralizes the virus. Okay? And that's the first and the best line of defense. If you have sufficient antibody there and it is neutralizing um, and can protect you against the strain that you're infected with, then you're going to be in pretty good shape because the virus will not uh, initiate infection. But even in the most ideal scenario, not every incoming virus of measles is, is, we won't be infected with a single particle. The exposure might be 100, might be 1,000, might be 10,000, depending on how much exposure you get. Okay? And it's very rare that every incoming virus particle is fully neutralized. Okay? Um, you might neutralize 99% of them, okay, but 1% might escape. Okay? So that's where the T cells come in. This is 
your second line of defense. T cells come in many different flavors, uh, but let's focus on this talk just on the cytotoxic T cells. These are the cells which can recognize cells infected with the particular pathogen or the virus or cancer, as, as you'll get to, uh, tumor cells again. And they will kill that, those infected cells because their receptor, they are specific for that particular pathogen or for that particular virus. These are the best killers that we have in our body. They're the best cells for eliminating infections. These cells can, by using their homing receptors and using appropriate uh, mechanisms, they are attracted to wherever the virus is. Let's say you have a liver infection, if, and it's uh, then the cells which recognize that virus in the liver will go to the liver and will kill the cell there. They can kill very efficiently. They can kill the cell in vivo, in the body, literally within minutes. If they find the cell, they are the right place, so they are the best eliminators of infection. So this is the combination. The pre-existing antibody is our first line of defense. The cytotoxic T cells that we have, these would be the memory T cells we have, again, that, that would then eliminate the infection. So our work has focused really on trying to understand how do you generate these long-term antibody responses? How do you generate memory T cells that will be there not just for six months or three months, but how can they, how can they be there for years and years? And what I'll share with you now is just a couple of points about antibodies. Uh, one of the main mechanisms for generating long-lived antibody responses and the cellular basis for that. And then a little bit about T cells. There I'll show you a slide that's needlessly complicated, but I'll tell you the important part. And because that's where, uh, that's, those studies is what led us to the, this, this break on the T cells has had some implications for immunotherapy. So who produces antibodies? Well, B cells produce antibodies. I think most of you know that. But, but B cells are actually come in many different flavors. You've got a naive B cell. What does a naive B cell mean? Naive B cell means that that B cell has the receptor. The receptor is, is the antibody expresses the receptor, that will, re let's take, let's stay with the uh, measles right now, okay? But that would apply to any of them. That has the receptor to recognize the measles virus. But right now, it has not seen measles virus. That's what we all have. That's how we uh, make the initial response, okay? And that's why the term, immunologists use the term naive. Naive means it has not seen the virus to which it, which it can recognize. And usually the antibody that's made by these cells is not a very high affinity. That it doesn't bind the antigen that strongly. After you get the infection, the cells go through a process of uh, making a, an antibody that will be much higher affinity for that one. Uh, so then you have memory B cells. And what we really want are these memory B cells to be around for many, many years so they can quickly respond. But I'm talking about preformed antibodies. That is antibody we already have. I'm not talking about the B cells, which have the capability of making them, but the preformed. So who makes the preformed, who's continuously producing antibodies? And, and that's a cell called the plasma cell. How many of you had heard of a plasma cell? Okay, that's good. So it's the plasma cells that are, this is a factory. This is a factory, it's on autopilot, and it's just continuously producing antibodies. It only has one function, <laughs> make antibodies. Okay. And if you look at the protein composition of the cell, over 50% or up in some, even 70% of the protein in that cell is just antibody, and it's secreting it continuously. Do you know where is the major reservoir of plasma cells in all of us. Blood, spleen, lymph node, bone marrow. It's the bone marrow. So the plasma cells reside predominantly in the bone marrow. Okay? Your
all B cells and T cells are circulating in the blood. They are also in what we refer to as lymphoid tissue, that is spleen, lymph nodes, and so on. Plasma cells predominantly reside in the bone marrow. And when we got into this, when we addressed this question about, so the question then was, important question, so plasma cells make, so then the question is, is the longevity of the plasma cells. So how long do plasma cells live? Because if you are to make, if these people in the Faroe Islands were protected for 65 years, of course no one looked at their antibody levels in the serum or their plasma cells in the bone marrow, none of this was known. <laughs> so you are, so a presumption is that the plasma cells in these individuals may have lived for 65 years. They would have been generated when they got the measles infection and were living for 65 years. And we started addressing this question in the 1980s after I had uh, started my lab at, um, at UCLA. And an outstanding graduate student, Mark Slifner, uh, who's now a professor at uh, Oregon. Uh, so Mark and I said, well, let's ask the question, how long do plasma cells live? Uh, so we did in mice. Of course, you do the experiment in mice because you can do the experiments cleanly and get definitive data. Okay. And at, at that time, we read the textbooks. We read the immunology textbooks. And the textbooks said that plasma cells live for four days in mice. And there were tons and tons of papers saying that plasma cells are very short-lived. You give the vaccine or you infect all of these experiments in mice. You infect the mouse or you vaccinate the mouse. Plasma cells which are specific for that vaccine or antigen are there for maybe a week. The most generous estimate was one week. Okay? Uh, and then it's gone. You don't have any plasma cells. Mice live for two years. So it was very short of protection even for mice. Mice are going to be present just within a week. We said this doesn't make any sense because you still have serum antibodies. Cinematic, but is still there, but these people are saying, these prominent immunologists are saying that plasma cells only live for four days. And their model was, well, you still have the virus there, you still have the antigen there, and that keeps stimulating the B cells. So their model was, plasma cells are short-lived, even after the infection is gone or the vaccine is gone, you still have a little bit of pieces of measles virus in your body, which you can never argue against because it's hard to prove a negative. Okay? Uh, and that uh, that's what now keeps stimulating your, what I show you, your memory B cells. They differentiate into plasma cells, so it's an ongoing process. So we said, let's address this more clearly okay? and look at it in more, more depth. We had no bias. We didn't want to, we were not on the short-lived plasma cell bandwagon. One of the advantages, as I told you, I did not train as an immunologist in my PhD. And that has great advantage. You don't belong to any camp. So you can say whatever you want. <laughs> You don't have any obligations to uh, people that you trained with and so on in terms of, uh, of what you're doing. <laughs> so, so we kind of said, let's address this question um, about this plasma cell longevity. Okay? And to make a long story short, work that was done by Mark Slifka uh, in my lab and around the time uh, a group in Germany, uh, Andreas Radbrook, they also came up with very similar observations. And these were papers that were published in 1988. And this is what we showed. What we showed, ignore all of that, okay? What we showed is that, yes, there is a short-lived plasma cell. And the short-lived plasma cell is made very early. And, and this is what you find in the spleen. All of these experiments, all of these experiments, which were wonderful experiments, there was nothing wrong with those experiments, okay? Because they were done by good scientists, had looked for plasma cells in either the lymph nodes of the mice or of the spleen of the mice. And indeed, they were absolutely correct. These cells are gone within a week. And these were actually the short-lived plasma cells. So we generate these short-lived, and humans do the same thing. Uh, you can find these in lymphoid tissues, in the blood, and then they disappear. But what Mark Slifka found, and also Andreas Radbrook in Germany found, was that you also have Why they're different, but the bottom line here was these 
these papers described the long-lived plasma cells, and we also showed that they live in the bone marrow. And so this has actually uh, resulted in a lot of strategies which are being used, that have been used for the last many years, in trying to push the right buttons. That is, you want a vaccine that will push the right buttons that will give you not just the short-lived plasma cell, but also the long-lived plasma cell responses. So you might be thinking, well, what he's saying can't be true because I get flu. I get flu every year. You know, people get flu repeatedly. There are other infections which happen again. And here the reasons are different. It's not that you don't get long-lived plasma cells after influenza infection. It's in this case, it's because the virus is changing. So the flu changes its shapes and uh, colors. And so you are protected against something you got before, but the new flu comes up, you're not fully protected against that. So really here, the virus is one step ahead of you and changing its shape. A similar problem is with HIV, which continues to change its shape. And that's why it's very difficult to make an HIV vaccine because you have so many different strains. Uh, so if the virus is not changing that much, then it's much easier to generate a vaccine and very easy to then get protective immunity long term, as it is for measles, chicken pox, smallpox, uh, polio, so on. Many viruses don't change that much. Vaccines are highly successful and give you very long term immunity. So this was the key. This is the so if you really want good protective immunity in terms of antibody responses, this is the key step. If you don't, if your infection not generate enough long-lived plasma cells is going to be a lousy vaccine. Okay, what about T-cell memory? What does T-cell memory reside in? So unlike antibody, um, where you have a cell which is constitutively on its own, autopilot, making, uh, making the antibody, T cells are a different beast. The cytotoxic T cells are only of value after the infection happens. So you can't have a fully cytotoxic T cell roaming around for years and years because there's no infected cells there anyway. Okay? So, this, so memory here, the important memory cell here is a small resting memory cell which has the capability of becoming cytotoxic very, very quickly upon re-exposure to infection. So this, in, in one case, already firing. In the case of a memory cell, it's a loaded gun. That way it's ready to go, seize the infection, boom, it's going to kill that cell. So we have done a major effort in our lab for the last 25, 30 years, has been understanding T cell memory. What are the buttons you need to push? What are the mechanisms uh, of longevity of the T-cell memory? Work that's been done by us and by my, many others have shown that humans also have very long-lived uh, memory T-cells. For those of you who were born <laughs> when, when the smallpox vaccination was still given, I'm one of those and there are many others in this room. If I took your blood, I, you, I, you will still have memory CD T-cells against the smallpox vaccine which would be a paper that we published and others also published 75 years later, 80 years later, after people got the smallpox vaccine, there are still in the blood a small proportion of memory CD8 T cells that recognize smallpox. Same is true of the yellow fever virus infection. 40, 50 years later, you still have it. And again, all of this is maintained in the absence of re-exposure. There's no smallpox circulating around anywhere. In fact, it's been eradicated. But still, people who got the vaccine when they were children still have that. So we, uh, this was work that Lisa Lau, another graduate student did, I mean, in, in my lab. And she showed that memory CD8 T cells live for very long periods and don't need any antigen fully stimulating them. And work done by many, many groups uh, have really built upon this observation and done wonderful molecular analysis of memory T cells understanding what gives them this longevity, what is the mechanism of that, how do we induce it in vaccines. But I want to just share with you one, one aspect. Again, ignore
know that slide. Okay? <laughs> I don't have a simpler slide for this. Okay? So we, no, look at that. Uh, uh, we asked the question, well, when you get like an acute infection, which is smallpox in humans, yellow fever in humans, uh, and then we have very good mouse models uh, for getting an acute infection, that is the virus is there for a couple of weeks, and then the mice live for three years, and they still have great memory cells. But what about a chronic infection? What if instead of having an acute infection, it was a chronic infection, like HIV, hepatitis B, HBV, or HCV? What will happen to the development of memory T cells if instead of the antigen being there for a short time, inducing the response and disappearing of the virus, you have here a lifelong or years and years of continuous stimulation. And this led to the discovery in our lab of this phenomena that we term T-cell exhaustion. So in the case of an acute infection, you end up with this wonderful scenario of highly functional memory cells. They're long-lived, they respond very quickly to reinfection, and provide very rapid immediate control. But if you have a chronic infection, we found that the T cells were still there because we could look at the specificity of those cells using the proven reagents, but they were no longer functional. So there was functional exhaustion of the T cell response. And this is important for several reasons. It was known from work that we had done and also others had done that people who have HIV infection or HBV infection or HCV or mouse models of chronic infection, that when you did, when you looked for functional assays for cells which were specific for that uh, pathogen that's persisting, that you couldn't get any response. So the assumption was that the T cell response was never induced properly or that the T cells got deleted. So the importance of this finding, and this is work that was done by Alan Zayat, who was a postdoctoral fellow in my lab at Emory. Alan is now a professor at UAB. What Alan showed is that the T cells are there, but they're not functional. There's a very big difference between cells not being there and cells being there but not being functional. Cells are not there, tough, you're <laughs> in a bad situation. Okay? But if the cells are there, but they're not functional, you can say, well, can I fix these cells? Because they're physically there. Can I do something now to make them functional again? And so this resulted, this was an observation that Alan made in 1998. A group in Switzerland, uh, Rolf Zinkernagel's group in Switzerland, also around the same time, described T-cell exhaustion. Both of these were done in mouse models, not in humans, the T-cell exhaustion. And scientists are highly skeptical about mouse studies, especially conditions. They say that mice lie, everything. <laughs> People even show slides, you know, mice lie. That'll be the first big slide will be. <laughs> My response to them is if you ask, the problem with you is you're asking the wrong question. That's why the mice are lying. <laughs> if you ask the right question and design correctly, the mice will be very informative. Uh, so after our group and the Zinkernagel group showed that there is, uh, the T cells get exhausted uh, under conditions of chronic stimulation, uh, these studies were very quickly extended, which was very nice, not by us, but by people working on HIV. They found the same thing, that people infected with HIV indeed have T cells, CD8 T cells that recognize the HIV virus, but they're not functional. People working on hepatitis B and hepatitis C infection found the same thing. Cells are there, but they're not doing much. Okay. People studying cancer models, uh, and also uh, not only cancer mouse models, but also human cancer, where they would look at T cells in the tumor. They find, well, T cells are there, but they're not functional. So this phenomena of exhaustion that we defined in a mouse model uh, was very quickly extended by others for human chronic viral infections and also for cancer. So then the question is, what is the mechanism of this exhaustion? Why are the T cells not functional? Why can't they kill? Why can't they proliferate? Why can't they um, secrete cytokines and antiviral molecules to control the infection? And this resulted in, uh, so what we then did 
was we, since we had a system where we could take this cell and we could take this cell, and our model allowed us to look at a dysfunctional T cell and a functional T cell responding to the same infection. So we were not comparing apples and oranges, but our mouse model allowed us to compare two flavors of the same fruit, one a good fruit and one a not such a good fruit. And we did gene expression profile. That is, we looked at 30,000 genes which are present in the good cells and 30,000 genes which are expressed by the bad cells. And we asked, what are the differences? And of course, there are many differences. But one thing that really stood up, that came out as being very highly expressed by these exhausted cells, is a molecule called of PD-1. Uh, I should also acknowledge that the gene PD-1 was clo not cloned by us, was actually cloned by Tetsuko Honjo, an outstanding immunologist in Japan. Okay. Uh, but this study, which was done by another graduate student in the lab, Alan Barber at uh, Emory, uh, this was the first linkage of this inhibitory receptor with T-cell exhaustion. So what we showed was that these cells that are not that functional express very high levels of this inhibitory receptor. That doesn't prove anything. A lot of things can be expressed on a T cell just because it's there doesn't mean it's doing anything. Okay? But then we were able to do a very simple experiment, very, very simple experiment. Uh, and this was done in collaboration with uh, a group at, uh, at Harvard and Dana Farber Cancer Institute, actually very good friends. Sometimes uh, history comes back. There was when I, was a, when I was a student uh, at Harvard Medical School, in the same lab was a, uh, another student named Arlene Sharp. And she was married to uh, uh, Gordon Freeman, who, who was also a graduate student. And we went our separate ways. I went and became an immunologist. Gordon Freeman, Arlene did other things. But Gordon Freeman, at some point, got interested in these molecules, the PD-1 molecules, and he had made antibodies. He had made an antibody that would block this receptor and prevents its inhibition. So we started a collaboration with Gordon Freeman, <laughs> who gave us an antibody that was directed to this inhibitory receptor. And this is a, considered to be like a blocking antibody. This antibody would block that receptor, uh, so now it could no longer convey the inhibitor. And so Dan Barber did a very simple experiment. He took a mouse that had this chronic infection. T cells were not functional. And all he did was he injected this antibody into the mice. The simplest experiment one can do. Okay? And the results were quite phenomenal. When he blocked this receptor, these T cells started proliferating. They became more functional. And they resulted in reduction so this was the first demonstration that one could reverse T cell exhaustion in vivo in an animal model and get not only functional cells, but get a reduction of the viral load. And this really had a fantastic effect <laughs> on the field. Uh, we did the simple mouse experiment. The other people did the more important experiments. And to make a long story very short, that within a few years, this phenomena had not only been extended into chronic viral infections, but where the real, real impact of this has come is in cancer immunotherapy. And work that has been done then by many investigators, I take zero credit for the cancer part except showing this uh, very fundamental observation, okay, uh, and was then picked up by, by a large number of pharmaceutical companies and within a few years of our paper and within a few years of uh, clinical trials, there are now uh, several PD-1 drugs that have been approved. Uh, so the first licensed drug was the MERT anti-PD-1 antibody that's been used for melanoma. Uh, they got phenomenal results in the clinical trials. 
the clinical trials, they found that up to 30 to 40 percent response rate in melanoma patients. These were late stage melanoma patients that had failed all the conventional therapies. I mean, uh, very late in melanoma, 30 to 40 percent response rate, and in a few percent of the cases, even complete responses. And because the results were so phenomenal in their phase one trial, uh, FDA gave them the, the, the special drug approval uh, to kind of fast track this. Okay? And so basically within a year or two years of their clinical trial, it was approved as a drug. And this is now a licensed drug for uh, melanoma. Uh, Bristol Myers Squibb was also running on this very fast. And they also got the license from the FDA. And now it's also being licensed for non small cell lung carcinoma. I don't know how many of you know about non small cell lung cancer, but it's one of the hardest cancers to treat. Conventional treatments like radiation, chemotherapy, really have had close to zero effect. And when the, fa when the, f the real excitement for BD1 came not only from the melanoma uh, trial that was done by Merck, but really came in that same, at the same time, there was a study done by BMS, Bristol Myers Squibb, about treatment of non-small cell lung cancer patients. And this was a intractable, incurable, really having no Im uh, effect whatsoever. They found up to 15 to 20% responders. Uh, you might say, well, it's only 15, 20%, but when it's 0% in a death sentence, some effect is really quite remarkable. Okay? So this was uh, also been licensed. So currently, now both Merck and BMS have uh, licensed the drug for um, both for melanoma and for non-small uh, cell lung cancer. Plus, there have been very good results for bladder cancer by Jeanette Tech Roche, and this will probably be licensed this year. Also for Hodgkin's lymphoma, anal cell carcinoma, so this has really, uh, this BD1-directed immunotherapy has been quite phenomenal in the last few years. What does this tell us? And I think to me this is the most exciting part. What this tells us, and something that was really not appreciated for a long time, is that our immune system can have an impact on cancer. And if you go back and look at the history of cancer, very early days, yes, there were people uh, Coley was one of the pioneers of this many, many years back, uh, saying that one could do something with our immune system to control cancer. That was completely dismissed in the last 30 or 40 years. So the conventional treatments for cancer were surgery, chemotherapy, and radiation. And they're all helpful. They all have their limitations and also some limits in there. But now, the biggest excitement in the field of cancer now is can we harness our immune system to provide some, uh, some benefit? Um, and now, actually, most of the meetings I go to now actually are cancer immunotherapy meetings, the cancer meetings, uh, which actually is a, is a great learning experience for me. Um, so, so what is the focus now uh, of our lab in some very basic work, but the real, the real studies in people, is that how can we improve it? So using PD-1 blockade as an anchor, there are all kinds of things going on now with Maybe PD-1 is not the only inhibitory receptor. Could be combination strategies, combining with cytokines, with therapeutic vaccination, combining with the radiation, T cell therapy. So immunotherapy now is one of the probably is, is at the center stage in terms of uh, cancer treatment. One could even combine immunotherapy with some chemotherapy. So the cancer, this people see this as a potentially a game changer for treatment of cancer. Uh, we are very very far in terms of cures from cancer. Uh, but I think we are at a stage where we'll be getting a little bit responses, you know, instead of it being a death sentence in a few months, I think that we are seeing more and more now for many cancers, some responses, not complete responses, but certainly some control of the tumor. And so that a person can have a longer lifespan and in a better quality. The other interesting thing about the immunotherapy is that the side effects especially with PD-1 blockade, is that the side effects are much less than something like chemotherapy or the radiation. And I'll, tell, I'll share with you um, a, a very small story about what uh, uh, Tony Rebus, Tony Rebus is an oncologist at UCLA, and he was involved in the first PD-1 trials uh, that were going on. This was Merck, but he 
was cut because he knew of our interest in working PD-1. He was actually keeping me in the loop confidentially with what's happening. Okay? And so one of the stories he shared to me is that they had done a study with you know 50 people who were, uh, you also always have to have some kind of a placebo control you know, in some things. Uh, but the most important uh, thing that he told me was that the people who were on PD-1 blockade, these are people who had already gone through chemotherapy, all kinds of treatment, and after the first few infusions, they came to him and he, they said, Doc, are you giving us anything? Because nothing is, I don't feel sick. Nothing is happening to me because the, typically the treatment was chemotherapy that made them really sick or radiation that made them very sick. Okay? So the side effects were hardly, were very, very minimal. So the side effect issue was also an important uh, thing in terms of uh, the immunotherapy. Okay? So let me now end by acknowledging probably the most important Oh, sorry, before I wonder two points, this is my second last slide. So what I want to leave with you is really the value of fundamental research. Um, by some fluke and some luck, some observation that we made have had an impact in the treatment of cancer. We, we never set out, we, we still don't study cancer in our lab. We don't, do, we don't even do mouse models of cancer. Okay? We asked a very simple question. We asked, what happens to T cell differentiation under conditions of a acute infection and a chronic infection. A very, very fundamental question about T cell biology. We were not thinking of any treatment, and certainly cancer was not even on our horizon. Okay? And I think this is how many, many of, uh, breakthroughs come through by people. There's now a push for directed research. Uh, you have to be directed on this or directed on that. And I think that's, it's good, one should have directed research, but it should not come at the cost of basic fundamental research. If you shift money away from fundamental research and put it just in directed research, you're going to lose out. You can go back and look at the, read the history of science and you'll see that almost every major observation that has been made that has had some applications has come from people just doing basic fundamental research. And then my last slide is really, uh, the other joy of uh, being a scientist. The two joys of being a scientist. One is the joy of discovery, and the other is the training of the next generation of scientists. Okay? And, and I've been very, very uh, fortunate to have had a truly outstanding group of scientists. Uh, I've, about 70 plus people have passed through the lab. More than half of them have their own labs and are highly, highly successful. So and this was a gathering that I had at my 60th birthday. Uh, many of them came from many different parts, and uh, and so it's been a wonderful journey. Thank you. Um, I'm wondering if this relates to a situation. I had a friend that had melanoma cancer, and they were injecting her tumors directly with some type of bacteria. No, that's different. This okay, one okay. is the way the treatment here is intravenous infusion of the antibody against the inhibitory receptor. So okay. basically, and the infusion is given every three weeks. Uh, and if the person is uh, responding to it, they keep the person on it. If after three or four infusions, there's no response, because not everyone responds, okay? Yeah. And I think they don't respond because they don't have enough T cell against the cancer. Mm -hmm. the, the, this particular regimen does not create the T cells. It only rescues the exhausted cells. I and see. that's why this, in the combination therapy, one of the strategies that will be used in the future is to combine a therapeutic vaccination to induce the T cells and with PD-1 blockade to keep them functioning. I see. Yeah. So the uh, so that treatment that your uh, friend got was very different from this one. Okay. Thank you. Yeah. Yes. Um, having had all of the childhood diseases myself, I was very <laughs> religious about vaccinating, immunizing my children. I now have a young friend who's just had her third baby and refuses to immunize those yeah. children. Is there anything we can do to convince them? Yes, I'm glad you brought that is? up. This is a 
huge problem. And this is not really my area of expertise, but at our vaccine center, we have, uh, our vaccine center really is quite comprehensive. We have basic scientists like me doing basic science. Uh, we have uh, people very directed research on malaria vaccines and HIV and flu vaccines. But then we have very strong vaccine policy group uh, that's headed by Walter Ornstein, uh, who was before head of the vaccine policy at CDC. He's now at a vaccine center and also a very outstanding young uh, um, physician and public health person, Saad Umar, who actually is a good friend of uh, Fahim Rahim. Okay? And if you give me your email address, I will connect you with Walt and with Saad. And they have prepared all kinds of uh, brochures on this. They've given wonderful talks. And I'm really glad you brought that up. And it's not that easy to convince someone otherwise. So, no, and of course, her concern is autism. Which absolutely, I think absolutely. Has, and we cannot. gone away, but we can't convince. No, her. and you cannot be dismissive of these concerns. Because right. if you're dismissive of these concerns, then people kind of dig their heels in. Mm -hmm. But please let me have your email, and I'll put you in touch with Walt and Saad. Thank you very much. Yeah. You said um, the first line of defense is antibodies. Yes. What happens when the antibody fights the immune system? How can you correct that? Sorry, when it what? What happens when the antibodies yeah. fight the immune system? And how can you correct that? What do you mean fights the immune system? When the antibodies are against us. The, yeah, the, yeah, oh yeah, good, yeah, very good, very the good. immune system. Yeah, 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 very good. So, so I think what you're saying is when we have some kind of a autoimmunity. Is that what you're talking about? Yes, right. So I'm glad you asked that question. So uh, if you see where is the impact of immunology, and I mentioned to you infections and cancers, and these are both instances where you want to turn on your immune system to fight these. But there are two other situations where immunology is very important. Uh, one is transplantation. So in a transplant setting, you want to turn off the immune system because you don't want your organ to be rejected. Uh, we don't work in this area, but this is a very active area of research by many people in terms of mechanism to turn off the immune system. And then the other one which you brought up, I'm glad you asked that question, is about autoimmunity. So autoimmunity is a big problem. Uh, and this is usually due either to antibody against your own uh, cells or T cells which are reacting with your own cells. Again, not an area of our interest and exp not an area of expertise, but in this case, there's a lot of work going on in many places of mechanisms for again turning off the immune system. Okay. There are no easy answers yet. I mean, there are drugs that suppress the immune system that are given. So the treatment basically for autoimmunity is immunosuppressive drugs currently. Um, and or it is uh, ablation of the B cells. None of these are perfect because they come at a cost. Uh, so I think that there are now more creative work being done to come up with strategies that may be more, more effective and less having side effects in terms of losing something. But they'll always come at a cost when you do the immunosuppressive drugs. Visa gift card donated by ISU Credit Union, as well as a free sub to Firehouse Subs. And the number is 304028. Perfect. Come on up. And the second door prize includes a gift card for two salads at Buddy's and a $10 gift card to Jimmy John's as well as some gear from ISU Credit Union. And the number is 304028. 